Right, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's Woodland webinar on the subject of management operations, different ways to manage on the ground. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we've got a good number of people, I think 35 people or so joining us this evening for the, the third of our webinars. Uh, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, please, Will. Um, if I could just remind people, please, to leave your microphone on mute um, so that we can hear the speaker clearly as we're going along this evening. Um, if you do have any questions, and we hope you do, then please use the chat function to ask those. You can access the chat function by moving your cursor to the bottom of your screen where you should see a, a row of icons pop up, and one of those is chat. If you click on that and then type in the little box that appears, if you're on a tablet, you might need to tap the screen and then you should be able to see the same thing. So, um, and also, as I've just said, we will be recording this webinar and making it available online. So please bear that in mind. Next slide, please, Will. So I'm Martin Glenn. I'm just gonna do a couple of introductory slides before I pass over to the main speaker for this evening, that's Will Richardson. Both of us are chartered foresters with uh, fairly extensive experience in the forestry sector. Uh, Will is a director of RDI Associates who's hosting this evening's webinar. Um, and I'm an independent chartered forester based in North Yorkshire. Um, and RDI Associates themselves are a, a company that undertakes various sort of forestry and project management consultancy work across the UK, including a range of training and awareness projects such as this. Next, please, Will. And just a little bit about the project, um, which these webinars are part of. Um, it's part of the Woodland Management Focus Area Pilot Project, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, that's funded through the Forestry Commission, um, through the Woods Into Management Forestry Innovation Fund. What we're doing in the project is using geographic information systems to identify clusters of unmanaged woodlands. Um, uh, for reasons that we spoke about in our first seminar, we know that Managing woodlands is, is good for a variety of reasons, not just producing timber, but also for biodiversity and recreation and landscape and all sorts of things. And this Woodland Webinar Programme is part of that project. And then we'll also be offering landowner support and advice within the focus areas. Those focus areas are, as I said earlier, are clusters of where there are large amounts of unmanaged woodlands. So if you are in one of those areas, you may well find us contacting you um, sort of in the new year to talk about that. And then also undertaking an evaluation of the woodland status against something called the United Kingdom Forestry Standard, which we talked about in last week's webinar, or sorry, the previous week's webinar, and um, we'll mention again this evening. So uh, that's me done now. I'm going to pass over to Will to talk about the subject of this evening's webinar. Thank you, Will. There we go. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, that's great. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, two sort of areas we're going to um, introduce uh, this afternoon, woodland operations. We're going to talk a little bit more about thinning, clear felling, selective felling, coppicing, um, talk about a little bit about restocking as well. Uh, various sort of uh, woodland operations um, more commonly used. And then we're going to just introduce the uh, topic of harvesting and extracting timber, looking at different methods of of achieving that. Um, it's very much a, an introduction. Uh, we can't really uh, do it full justice. It's a huge topic in itself. Um, uh, but as Martin said, please do ask questions. We want this to be interactive. Um, it, it, even if you, uh, sorry, if you joined us at the previous two sessions as well, and you maybe have some follow-up questions on that, please do feel free to also um, uh, post those as well. Obviously, we, we looked at the um, issue around storm damage last last week. So again, if there's anybody who joined us there and you've got follow-up questions, feel free to, to post those. We don't have last week's panel with us, but we can certainly forward on those questions um, uh, quite happily. Um, uh, hopefully, Martin's uh, going to be monitoring those questions as we go along, and then we'll, we'll pick that up at the end of the session. Uh, there's a series of slides towards the end of the session, which are just different um, uh, uh, items of equipment and machinery uh, that we, we can uh, consider using. Uh, it may be that we do go through those relatively quickly uh, and we focus on, on the initial part of, of the presentation. Um, so our first session, we looked at uh, the UK forestry standard and 
this introduction to woodland management, why we manage, why should we manage woods? Um, and we introduce these key concepts, biodiversity, climate change, historic environment, landscape, people, soil and water. Uh, so we have that always at the back of our minds. Um, uh, and again, the, the, all these themes are relevant to what we discussed tonight and all our follow up um, uh, sessions as well. And we also talked about a, an appraisal on your woodland, a, a, a constraints, opportunities and threats assessment. Um, and essentially the results of this was sort of your initial assessment and, and, and uh, information gathering about your woodland is going to help inform your operational activities. What are you going to do to achieve your objectives? How are you going to set about doing that? So our initial part of this session, we're going to introduce these key concepts of thinning, clear felling, regeneration and or selective felling, kind of an interchangeable term there, coppicing and looking at restocking and natural regeneration in our woods. Um, uh, if there are particular, particular themes in here, again, please ask them in the chat and hopefully we'll also address them in, uh, or go into further detail in future seminars as well. Because again, we can't really have the time to do this full justice tonight. Um, so thinning, I, I essentially introduced this in our first session. So we're looking at thinning to essentially um, uh, improve our woodland. So it could improve our woodland for timber quality. and Indeed, it could improve our woodland for nature conservation value as well. So we're looking at removal of pr proportion of the trees within our wood. Um, that allows more growing space for the remaining trees and it can help to increase the total yield of usable timber over the life of, of that particular stand of trees as well. We're not just doing it for timber production, but thinning is good for nature conservation, recreation, amenity, sporting interest as well. Um, thinning of broadleaves will differ in some respects to the thinning of conifers in as much that a broadleaf crop, if you're growing it for timber quality, you're selecting your trees for thinning based on that quality. So you're gonna favor uh, your best stems, the ones that are gonna grow on and be your final uh, trees, the best, the highest quality trees. And um, that's not necessarily the case with conifers. You may just say, right, we're just gonna go through and remove 30%. Um, yes, you could get an operator, a skillful operator to try and select the poorest stems and leave the weaker sense, but it's not, the emphasis isn't quite as much on that as it would be on a broadleaf crop, for example. Um, what I want to pick up on is, 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 is thinning, that's just a stand actually that I, I was involved in earlier this year, just looking at actually doing a full thin throughout as a mixed stand, larch and beech, and um, uh, we wanted to go through and just do a 30% thin throughout to increase light levels. Uh, essentially, and that was part of it on, on an ancient woodland site, so it had obviously timber production as a as an objective, but also improving light levels because it was very dark in there. Beach woodlands can often be very dark to so increase light levels and increase ground flora. So, you know, a couple of key drivers in that particular one. What I want to do is pick up a few themes on thinning in terms of not just in terms of timber quality, but um, uh, what it's going to do to your to your crop, how your crop might react to it. So thinning can and should foster mixed stands and, and, and hopefully introduce a bit more irregularity within your woodland as well. Increase those light levels. So I mentioned that on the previous slide, but benefiting uh, woodland flora and species that rely on those. Um, it should help reduce competition for available nutrients with your remaining trees and improve uh, conditions for natural regeneration. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail a bit later. Uh, we spoke about obviously um, uh, timber quality and hopefully thinning should lessen susceptibility to biotic stresses. So this is our pest and diseases, particularly what we're seeing now is an increase in, in incidences of fungal pathogens. So ash dieback, uh, phytophthora and larch. Again, thinning can help um, uh, reduce or, or lessen that susceptibility and hopefully should lessen susceptibility to abiotic stresses. So I incidences of storm damage, wind blow, what we talked about last week as well. So there's some other key outcomes from thinning. Uh, so this is a stand here, again, I was involved in recently, a pure conifer stand. You can see in the background how dense and dark it was and how much more light we've got on the bottom, how much more space those trees have got. Again, this is actually an ancient woodland site as well. 
and we wanted to try and encourage recolonization of, of floral species in, in that stand through quite a heavy thin that again 30 percent um uh, thin in that stand there um so clear felling again we talked about this briefly in our first session uh primarily done for economic reasons so we're looking at a single species crop it's reached its rotation um uh, whether that's economic or it's reached its maximum increment it's not really going to put on much more timber you go in you harvest it and you restock it uh, restocking has to be a, carried out according to best practice set out in the uk forestry standard so i consider your your soil type etc etc um, and and, and um, uh, select your species accordingly and that's all about diversifying uh, single species plantations um, again the reasons for the previous slide um, uh, also stand here in terms of diversifying your species base you're re you're reducing your risk of things like uh, incidences of, of pest and disease damage um, uh, could in, by, by introducing other species they're going to grow at different rates so you're, you're again bringing in some irregularity in, into what was once a regular uh, uniform crop um, and of course we can carry out clear felling for tree health reasons where stands might become infected um, or you've got planning obligations so clearance for development for example would be um, uh, something you, you consider clear felling for uh, so again a recent clear fell site that i was involved in we took out a, a mature uh, stand of, of norway spruce uh, back to a, a mixed broadleaf stand and we will actually restock with conifers on this site it's not an ancient woodland site uh, so we will uh, and we'll probably restock it with a much reduced uh, percentage of spruce probably around about 60 percent and we'll bring in a couple of other species into that maybe a bit of douglas fir and some some broad leaves in there as well probably up to 15 percent broad leaves on that side and allow for a bit of open ground so buffering a bit of open ground against the mixed broad leaves here put in some mixed broad leaves adjacent and then put in your your um, uh, conifer species here in the middle of the site something like that so that's clear felling and then there's often talk about regeneration or Called, referred to by often by the Forest Commission regen regeneration felling at the moment, but we also can refer it to as selective felling. So we may be um, uh, intervening in a stand that may have a couple of different species in, for example, let's say a stand again of beech and larch, for example, and you may want to fell out all the larch and leave the beech. And that could uh, uh, provide um, uh, open areas which may need restocking. So it's more than a thin, but less than a clear fell. And you could do that again for tree health reasons, silvicultural reasons, where removing a nurse crop, uh, economic reasons, where a species is reaching economic rotation ahead of others. And of course, nature conservation reasons where you might want to remove undesirable species such as non-natives on ancient woodland sites. Um, slightly harder to, to visualize uh, a selective fell, but this little photo here, is uh, a site where we removed some sycamore um, uh, and restocked it with mixed broadleaves and, and some a shrubby element in there as well, some hazel, et cetera, uh, and left some timber on site as deadwood. Again, nature conservation being a key driver on that particular site there. Um, uh, uh, you may find that, 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 that selective and regeneration fairing uh, becomes more important with the control of ash dieback, uh, particularly where you may have pure stands of ash that are, are really suffering uh, and you may want to remove the dead and really, really uh, uh, poor, poor trees and try and retain some ash. So you maybe have got some um, uh, succession there or encouraging some regen uh, tends to be the, 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 the sort of the thought processes at the moment. Um, uh, you could apply that uh, uh, regeneration flow, if you like, uh, to a site like that. Um, okay. Uh, and then move on to coppice again introduce this on the first session so we're talking about small di dimension material uh, you've got nature conservation as an important consideration and of course we're only going to do it to broadleaves um, most of our native broadleaf species will readily coppice given the right conditions obviously key species are things like hazel as we all know uh, but things like sycamore beech oak they'll all coppice as well um, uh, Again, I, I apply this on, on, on sort of open edges of open space. 
So here's our, our, this is actually adjacent to a main ride through a woodland. I've got a nice uh, herb layer here. And then we coppice the hazel back in a line here, as you can see the brash there, back to uh, um, maturing broadleaves. And then behind that, we've got a stand of, of, of maturing conifers. Again, you're diversifying your woodland, giving it more structure, more irregularity. Uh, I think coppice is a very important tool personally, particularly if you want to be introducing diversity into pure crops. You may have to do a bit of supplementary planting um, uh, to achieve that. Uh, but you've got this sort of this gradual woodland edge uh, effect uh, that you're creating. Uh, so I think it's a very important tool for achieving um, uh, uh, multiple objectives within your woodland. Um, so let's talk about restocking. So we've gone in, we may have done our intervention, whether it's selective felling, clear felling, etc. So what are our considerations? There's quite a lot. There's quite a lot to consider. Um, you've done your desk-based research, you've done your, 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 your assessments, you understand what your soils are, so you maybe have an idea of things like fertility, uh, that can definitely um, influence how you, how you do any ground preparation and follow-up maintenance in terms of controlling weed growth, etc. So you're going to say, well, what species am I going to use? How am I going to prepare the ground? Do I take the brush off? Do I leave it? Do I need to disturb the soil, such as scarification in, in, in any way? What protection methods am I going to use? Pest control. Um, think about your, uh, replacing losses. Um, uh, do you want to intervene with early uh, interventions, such as early thinning, respacing, or formative pruning of your crop? And then future maintenance might include roads, tracks, gates, fences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and what about uh, natural regeneration as opposed to your intervention planting? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So again, here, there's a site, a clear fell site, uh, conifer converting it into a, uh, a mixed broadleaf um, uh, woodland, predominantly oak. We put in, I think, 60% uh, oak and another mixed broadleaf, some hazel, etc. Uh, a wet site and inaccessible, hence uh, one of the drivers to convert from conifer to um, uh, mixed broadleaves. We had a very expensive uh, reinstatement uh, cost because uh, we had to travel quite a long way across a couple of um, uh, quite uh, uh, good uh, uh, pasture, um, uh, permanent pasture fields to get there. So uh, avoid that in the future by um, uh, converting it uh, to a native, uh, slower growing woodland. Um, so let's think about natural colonisation, natural regen. Um, it can offer some key benefits to you, the, the forest forest manager, low cost establishment, uh, built in resilience for a local seed source. You're pretty pretty um, sure that uh, uh, if it's regenerating freely, that the, the, the trees are going to thrive. Um, it can help increase your structural diversity. So I mentioned irregularity, so varying ages and height of of your trees, and that's obviously great again for uh, diversifying the wood. And again, you can lead to increased open scrub and edge habitats within that. So here's a here's a, an area glade here um, that we fell out about uh, uh, five six years ago, and it's obviously colonised by birch. You'd expect that in many instances, but all I've got there is birch, nothing else. So it begs the question: What are the drawbacks on natural regeneration? So there are limitations to it. It can be slow to establish. Um, uh, you are reliant, but reliant on viable seed sources that's going to suit the local soil and climatic conditions. So obviously, you've got to think about your seed trees here as well. Um, uh, you may end up with a narrow uh, genetic diversity uh, because you are reliant on maybe a small number of seed trees. Uh, you may end up with limited species diversity. So that, that uh, example of that photo of a pure uh, birch um, uh, coming in there. And you may end up with species you don't want. So again, you need to consider your site selection carefully. What are your objectives? What are you growing for? What are your longer term uh, uh, goals with, with, uh, uh, with that? And then again, consider protection. Um, difficult to protect individual naturally generated trees. So you may have to apply other strategies. That might mean uh, keeping deer numbers down or fencing, for example. Um, and I would always 
uh, consider supplementary planting if your desired stocking and species are not achieved. And I would certainly start to think about that after a couple of years. So monitor carefully um, how successful is this uh, uh, method? Um, uh, and do you need to intervene? And it's not a bad idea to intervene early if you think you do as well and, and not leave it too late. So, okay, um, how are we doing for time? Um, uh, let's think about harvesting extraction. So as I said, I, I, I might just spend a little bit less time on this, this section, uh, particularly when we come to look at the different machines, et cetera, available to us, um, uh, just to allow more time for, I think, for questions and answers. Um, so we're going to talk about safety considerations. Again, we introduced this uh, uh, last week, um, uh, the storm damage um, session. We're going to talk about environmental considerations, terrain, access, um, uh, harvesting systems and machine choice. So safety. Okay, I, this is something I spoke about uh, uh, last week. Really important. Uh, consider what your roles and responsibilities are. If you are uh, the landowner or the, the forestry manager, uh, what, 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 what those divisions of roles and responsibilities are. Are you the landowner and the forestry manager all wrapped into one? And what, are, what would you expect of your contractor? Um, now, some of these things we'll probably pick up in later um, uh, sessions. Uh, we're going to do one on, 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 on um, marketing timber uh, in the new year. And this is something we can pick up on uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and as I introduced last week, FISA, the Forest Industry Safety Accord, has some really great training uh, uh, guides and advice on this, on this topic. Environmental considerations. So your small woodlands are particularly vulnerable to environmental damage during, during operations. And that might mean really small scale operations as well. You get localised uh, soil damage. Um, if you're running up and down um, a lot, it might be uh, because of inappropriate machinery, so, such as farm tractors, um, uh, limited supply of brash to run across if you've got a wet site. So think about the timing, what, you, what time of year, um, do you go ahead if the ground is really wet? Um, think about protecting water courses, um, and of course, you know, depending on what the woods might be used for, such as shooting, there might be uh, restricted access to certain times of the year. Um, your work should be planned to minimise those environmental impacts. So protecting soil, protecting the ground vegetation, particularly if it's an ancient woodland site, um, protecting wildlife, protecting water and archaeology as well. Um, again, those sort of elements you'd be looking at picking up on your site assessment work and your, your cot assessment uh, beforehand. Um, so we're looking at terrain. So considering machinery use, the following factors I'd certainly consider is firmness of your soil, the roughness, boulders, stumps, uneven ground, etc., and the slope. Um, is there a danger of machines overturning, uh, particularly uh, side slopes will, will always be um, a, a major limiting factor um, of what you can and can't do. Um, we've got access. Uh, so do you have roads or hard standing that you can use um, points of where you can uh, uh, take the timber to so it's ready to be picked up or obviously for your own use as well? Uh, what inward access do you have, uh, if at all any? If you don't, what are the options? Uh, you can run on brash mats, for example. Um, think about the extraction distance that you might have. Um, so if you're looking at you know distances over half a kilometer that'll start to have that that, that impact that, that financial impact reduced timber value etc um, uh, and obviously that uh, that increases the further you have to extract the timber uh, and then protecting your remaining trees obviously if you're doing a thinning or, or regeneration for them. Okay, so uh, just quickly then, uh, before we go to uh, a Q&A, um, uh, machines. Yeah, lots of them out there. Uh, big machines, slightly smaller machines. Um, and then we've got obviously motor manual, uh, chainsaw, and of course a good old 
fashioned uh, hand tools, bow, bow saws, etc. Uh, machines, you'd be looking at big ones working the larger size. So that might not be appropriate to your situation. So there are smaller machines out there. There are contractors with smaller, more compact machines that, that can suit working in small areas of woodland and, and smaller, particularly thinning operations, more maneuverable, uh, less impactful on the site. Obviously, uh, motor manual, um, people with chainsaws or hand tools, that's very limited uh, ground impact indeed or, 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 in that regard, but obviously time consuming. Um, what I will say is linking your large scale harvesting to large scale uh, uh, forwarding, so a machine of this size, you're going to get through your, your operational activity quickly, much more quickly. And it is a consideration if you are looking after ancient woodland sites, whether or not that is more appropriate than smaller scale machinery, which might be traveling over the site a, a lot more times to carry away that timber. And would it be less impactful if a larger machine were to do fewer um, uh, travel, so to speak? It's worth considering that. So in terms of getting the, once it's felled the timber away, there is a massive range of equipment out there, um, all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, a skyline you're fixing on a steep slope and you, you'll be needing to harvest a lot of timber on a steep slope to make that worthwhile. So maybe not that appropriate for this conversation, but there's the small, what we call mini forwarders, compact forwarders out there. They're obviously carrying lighter loads they have less ground impact, but there are contractors out there with this sort of machinery. Again, they can work in smaller woods, smaller scale thinnings, or you can apply them, let's say, to higher value timber as well. Um, you can get obviously get tractor based forwarders, timber trailers that are quite happily mounted on, on a tractor with a, with a crane fitted on the trailer or on the tractor itself. Um, skidding, so again, a, a winch. Um, uh, you get uh, dual winches, single winches attached to uh, a tractor to pull your timber out that way. Uh, obviously, you can you do a lot of skidding. Uh, you can get a lot of dirt on the timber. Uh, and obviously, if you've got high quality uh, wood, you may not want to be doing that too much. Um, mini tractors, again, all these kits available. There are contractors out there with assorted equipment. Horse logging, good for sensitive sites and can work on very poor terrain as well. Um, uh, but obviously you're reducing your capacity. You're slowing things down somewhat with, with that, but can be very good on very sensitive sites. Um, and then very small scale bits of kit. So you can buy trailers that will uh, uh, go on uh, things like quad bikes. Obviously you, you need quite a powerful bike to, to be pulling a fair weight. Um, uh, so yeah, lots out there. These are little like mechanical wheelbarrows effectively. Uh, again, slow, but again, you know, for extracting short distances, maybe for your own use, might come in use. Uh, just things to consider. I've never seen one of these in operation. Uh, I don't know anybody that's ever used it, uh, but uh, log shoot, um, uh, I'm aware of them. But like I say, I can't speak from experience. I'd imagine that they could probably be quite problematic and in, in getting jammed, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I've put other things like uh, need steep slopes, manual loading and difficult to set up and I imagine difficult to take away as well. Uh, but I'll put that up there just as an example. Uh, okay, so that's a quick run through that. Hopefully we've got some questions coming in. Um, just to finish off again, I think we're going to do this on all our, all our sessions. Just be mindful of biosecurity. Uh, plant health is a big issue for us. Um, lots of pathogens out there that we need to be mindful of. So good to practice uh, and follow the keep it clean um, uh, guidance, which again, we'll provide that link at the end there. Uh, keeping uh, plant debris and soil, remove it before you, you leave site. That's the key to it. Um, uh, a water, um, a bucket of, of, of water to do that. And then if you have it, some kind of disinfectant as well as good. But uh, the, the best practice is there uh, on the link there. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, we'll go to um, uh, question and answer, I think, Martin. Uh, do you just want to talk about the next the next session? Yeah, we will do. Thank you very much for work, for that, Will. That was really good. So, yeah, um, the next webinar, we'll, we're taking a bit of a break now till the new year. 
Um, so the next one is on Tuesday, the 11th of January, when we'll be talking about regulations and incentives. And we'll be covering things like uh, grants that are available for managing woodlands. Uh, if we get time, we might just touch on the issue of, of grants for new woodland creation as well. Felling licenses and how to get those, and also the relative sort of benefits of tax treatment of woodlands, of which there are numbers you might be aware, and also just touch on the issue of planning permission that is available for woodland roads and buildings, uh, which are not dissimilar to those which apply to farming. But we'll just um, we'll just mention those as well. So, so um, having just given Will a quick break anyway uh, from the from the talking, we'll now go on to the questions and we've got a good number of those. Um, so um, I, what I'm going to do then is I'll go to each of you in turn as you've asked your question and just ask you to unmute yourself. And if you want to turn your camera off as well, you can do so um, and, and ask your question. If you'd rather not do that, if you want me to ask it, please just just say, put it in the chat or something, we'll do that. Uh, we've got a good, good, few, uh, good few questions there anyway. So. Um, first one's from Mark Corner. Um, Mark, if you're still around on the call, if you'd just like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Will. Yeah, my question is about um, the timing of first thinning. So I have a 20 year old broadleaf amenity woodland. When should I think about a first thinning? And what should what spacing should I aim to be leaving between the remaining trees? Thank you. Uh, great. Question mark. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, have, have all the tubes been taken off? Uh, most of them, yes. Yeah. And do you know what spacing it was planted at originally? Two meters? I, I think about two meters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I I wouldn't be I wouldn't be um, uh, too shy. I would certainly think about removing at least one in four of those trees. Are they? Particularly if you've got the canopies are brushing against one another, it's very close. They're very, uh, I'd imagine they should be close at this 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 point in time at 20 years old. Ideally, for a, a, a mixed broadleaf plantation that's about 20 years old, you 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 know you want to be thinning it between years 15 and 20, and not leaving it much longer than that. A uh, couple of things to be mindful of. Uh, one is grey squirrels, sadly. Um, that will be a recurring theme, uh, no doubt, for many of us. Uh, but it is a consideration. Uh, um, uh, when you do a thinning, particularly broadleaf trees, uh, the next sort of couple of growing seasons, the trees will react quite quickly to that and increase the phloem levels. And they become particularly interesting to grey squirrels at that point. So my recommendation is try and trap as many and remove as many, trapping, shooting, etc., before you're thin, and again do it immediately after, uh, because you may see an increased incidence of squirrel damage. And, and, and broadleaf stands between the ages of eight and forty are particularly susceptible to grey squirrel damage, sadly. Uh, so that's certainly something to be mindful of. And the space I should leave between the, those that are left? Well, if you're removing one in four, I mean, you could even remove one in three. So I would I would try and thin thin out your worst stems. So which are the weakest ones, which are looking um, uh, not as vigorous? Uh, I, they're the ones I'd, I'd mark. Is it a large area, Mark? 80 acres. No, it is quite large then. Um, that's a lot of marking up to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so you're going from, let's say, two metres, you're probably increasing that spacing to around about an average of two and a half, something like that. You may have already noticed some uh, natural thinning anyway. Uh, not all the trees would have made it, I'm guessing, yeah. uh, and some would have died. Um, and some are more slow going than, uh, than others. Yeah, yeah. What, what would you want to see as your, sort of your, your climax uh, trees in the crop? I don't know. I'm just looking for a woodland that's you know, ideal for uh, for wildlife. I want some firewood extraction. So, uh, is it got oak in it? Yeah. So I would certainly do any thinning to favour uh, the oak, so they would grow on to become the mature woodland um, for sure. Uh, they're the ones that will grow the slowest, so they're the ones that are going to need the most space. Great, so really... I would say if you're going to get a felling license, go for a 25% thin 
and um, get your contractor to get, say to your contractor, yes, I want to favour the oak. Uh, Thank you. And they should know to respace based on that information. That's really helpful, thanks. Thanks, Will, Tal. It was a really good mention there also about the issue of grey squirrels because, you know, experience suggests that once a, a, a youngish crop like that is thinned, grey squirrels, even if they're not present in the area at the moment, will move in and can very quickly devastate a young broadleaf crop and wipe out all the good works that you've, you've spent many years doing. So certainly well worth thinking about that anyway. So, um, And, you know, I did put in the chat there that if there are any subjects that people want us to... Um, look at in some of the future webinars then just to let us know so you know maybe if gray squirrel control or deer control or whatever is is one of those then then that might be something we want to suggest that we that we do think about anyway so okay thanks for that mark so the next question is from jp um, um if you'd like to unmute yourself there you are thank you yep uh good evening um so we're in suffolk got six acres of coppice sweet chestnut on sand um, yes, there is some oak and some silver birch and a few other bits and pieces. Uh, our intentions are biodiversity and amenity. And what we have at the moment is ludicrously overgrown coppice. So uh, we've got we've got stools with, say, seven stems, which are 60 foot high and a big canopy right at the top. So in summer, it's dark. Um, there's a there's a parcel next to us which kind of we look at that and go well that's nice and i think their sort of tree density is roughly half what ours is um is that achievable i mean does it still count as thinning when you're taking out 50 percent well it's a good question uh jp i think we've had this conversation previously actually it's an interesting case study yours uh, you may uh, did we did we end it by saying, I, I used the get out card of saying, speak to your local woodland officer? You did, uh, yes. I think I did, didn't I? Yeah, as, a, as, a, as an easy get out there. I, I, I definitely do that. I would say you're close to be a regeneration stroke selective fell. So, um, and then what you want to be saying is that uh, we're not restocking, we're going to rely on, on coppice regrowth. And then to manage that stand on that basis. But then... Uh, to say, actually, do we want to introduce some new species, hazel, for example? Yeah, yes. So that not just have dominant, you know, the whole thing dominated by sweet chestnut. Um, uh, so I'm we still going to use the get out card and talk to the woodland officer, your local woodland officer, and get their advice whether or not they think it's a thinning or it is actually, it, it needs to have a conditional license, such as a, a, a selective fell or a regeneration fell. I wouldn't say it's a clear fell. You're not clearing the whole site. Oh, no, 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 definitely not. Um, uh, and, and, and also consider doing it on a, a coop basis, small coops. Uh, they could be, let's say, 10 metres by 10 metres, 15 metres by 15 metres, and fell everything within each coop. Um, make the coop big enough so there's enough light to obviously encourage A, regrowth, and sure. A, supplementary planting you might do but the, the coops don't need to be as big as an acre as you say just 10 meters by 10 would, yeah, yeah. would do yeah 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 it depends yeah. how high your your existing trees are 60 foot much, yeah 60 foot yeah easily so what's that in in new money that's um, um 20 meters 20 meters okay then you may need to extend the coop area to about 20 by 20 then yeah okay to yeah. get enough light in because they um, they the, the flip side is, uh, again, a bit, a bit further away from us are, are a few more coops where they have been actively coppiced maybe 20 years ago. And to be honest, it's so dense and the regrowth is actually, I don't find it very beautiful. Okay. Um, at, at, that, at that age, it, it's quite oppressive. And I want to avoid that because I want I want the woodlands to be pretty. Sure, sure. So it does sound as if you need to bring some diversity, not just a species but height as well uh, so mm, yes. maybe that coop uh, basing it on that coop small coop basis coop felling which you would need um a regeneration felling license for so that would be conditional that you, you restock in effect. so we, we could restock with some hazel in this one yeah. and some yeah, yeah. Well, okay, that's an... you, use the um again this is something we'll introduce at another another session the um uh the um, 
ecological site classification decision support tool, which can help sort of match species to the soil conditions that you have. Mm. Uh, I imagine because you've got sandy soil, you'll be looking at species that aren't prone to, uh, you know, dry conditions, droughting off, etc. Um, uh, yeah. So you may need to to think about your species selection quite yeah, we, carefully. Yeah, we, we've got six foot of sand. Yeah, it's not, not even soil; it's sand. <laughs> yeah, you'll need to be very careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it chestnut grows well there. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Right. Well, it obviously does. It's six feet yeah. tall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks thank so you. much, JP. Yeah, I, and I think, as well said, I think it's certainly worth thinking about diversifying that, not least because sweet chestnut is susceptible to a number of pests and diseases, which are, you know, coming into the country now already here, and, and you really want some diversity there to um, to cover those sorts of things. So, good. Thank you, JP. Um, so, just moving on now to um, Andy. I can see you there, Andy, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, sure. I've got a, a number of um, broadleaf woodlands on the farm, quite small woodlands, um, but there's loads of holly, invasive holly. I wonder, I'd be interested to hear the views of um, how we should be managed. Yeah, it's a good point. Holly can become quite, um, quite keen in certain situations. Uh, is the holly, what's the holly growing underneath? What have you got? Birch, oak, sycamore? Uh, all of the above, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's liking the light levels. Um, it may be that you have to cut some of it out. Uh, try and uh, um, uh, focus on, on those uh, trees that are, are covered in berries. Uh, that's your seed there. So try and uh, reduce the seed source as much as you can. It, it might just need a bit of physical work to do that. Um, it sounds like it's probably an ancient woodland if it's got holly regenerating freely in it. Does it have bluebell in it at all in the spring? Yeah, yeah some, a couple of the woods have got bluebells, yeah. You're right. And it's liking the light levels, definitely. Uh, I, I'm actually seeing it more and more. I, I also think it's a result of possibly deer numbers being reduced. Uh, yeah. While we're seeing more, more holly regenerate more freely, there's not as much browsing. Um, you're obviously keeping livestock out as well. Um, yeah, it may just be that you've got to A, remove that, that, that seed source and, and, and B, just do a little bit of clearing. Um, uh, Certainly made a start on it anyway, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Are you wanting to thin the woods? Is, that, is it something that you want to do? Yes, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Is that I want to make them work and wooden, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, obviously that's going to increase your light level. So you may just need to monitor again how much holly you're getting in. And if that's the case, then, you know, maybe some supplementary planting of other species. Uh, okay. Hazel, for example. Yeah, good. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Will. Thank you very much for that. Good time of year to be thinking about clearing holly out anyway. So um right so moving on to alec i can see you there already if you'd like to ask your question yeah hi thank you um so we have a woodland with a part of it is a sick spruce plantation uh, it's probably about 50 years old quite tall and historically um we've recently purchased this woodland but historically it's been it's never been thinned at all probably so uh, the spruce are very close together and they're very tall and straight which is sometimes good. Unfortunately, Storm Arwen uh, flattened about half of that plantation right across the middle, about eight or nine acres. Um, and we're meeting some arborists uh, next week to talk about how we can make the site safe and all that sort of stuff. Um, my question was really about the, the edge, the, the edge down the middle of the spruce plantation, which is now exposed. Um, is that weakened? Well, it will be weakened because the, the internal sort of spruce um, trees. And, and is, are there any techniques to gradually strengthen that edge by thinning, like, um, you know, cutting into it, um, making it a jaggedy edge or something? Or do we have to realistically fell the lot because it's weakened and unsafe? And there's a public bridleway that runs through the middle of it as well. Okay, not easy, Alec. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you've had that storm damage. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's not it's not great. Um, so un unthinned tall Sitka spruce is going to be prone to wind blow. Sadly, um, what sort of soils are they? Do they get wet? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty wet. Um, yeah. yeah. 
that can exacerbate the problem, uh, particularly if you've got wet flushes. Um, it can make the root plates a little bit weaker. Yeah. Uh, and once you get wind, get wind blow in, you will get more. Um, uh, it won't probably won't stop where it is. Um, okay. This, this, there's, there's a couple of options here. One is to clear fell the lot and start again, yeah. which you probably don't want to do. Uh, two is to try and fell up to what I would call a wind firm edge. So where the bridle way is, is there a clearing either side of the bridle way or the spruce no. right up tight against this? No, it's right, it's right up tight and it's right down the middle where there, there are the tallest you know, trees, the weakest trees, effectively. Okay, and is it all just one block? There's no breaks in it, there's no open ground or? Well, they actually break where this bridleway was. Uh, that was like a 15 foot break, naturally, because the bridleway ran through it. Yeah. And that's where the wind throw has stopped. Yeah, that's the wind firm edge then. So maybe you can clear up to that wind firm edge. If you see what okay. I mean, if, if, if those trees are standing, and uh, have you got more branches on the side of those trees? Yeah, possibly. Uh, I'm not sure that it is. I know what the wind firm edge is. I know yeah. I know about wind firm edges. Yeah. And we do have those around the outside. You can see yeah. the diameter of the trees is much greater around the edge. Yeah. Right. And that's that's easy to see. But yeah. the bridal way isn't really exposed to any wind because it's such a right. deep um, plantation. Okay. Very right. tall plantation. So I think it's just been the edge of the the wind throw or blowdown because they've all domino together in the right direction in in parallel with the bridle way so okay. that's why the bridle way has been the, the edge that they've stopped at does that make sense yeah yeah it does yeah it does it does yeah it sounds like a tough decision um are there any techniques to to cut the edge to to, to thin the edges that might help with that um yeah, if your crop's 50 years old and it's pretty tall, I think anything you do will increase the risk of the rest of it blowing down. Yeah. Uh, it, I, it, it's, yeah, it's, a, it, I, um, so it's, it, it's not uncommon in, you know, if you're saying that the, the, the trees haven't been thinned in the past, that they're not going to be wind firm. I mean, that's another reason for thinning. I mentioned about, you know, reducing the impact of, of abiotic stresses. Uh, thinning helps to do that, puts more strength into the trees. They've got more room to put their roots down. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one, that. Um, yeah, if you don't have a wind firm edge you can clear up to, then it, it, so any, I, anything I've you do the, now, I think, will probably increase your incidence of further wind blow. Right, OK. So the Forestry Commission are saying that you can, you can fell stuff that's unsafe without a licence now. And we were actually just in the process of drafting up our um, application for a license and now we have to change all that um, but with that in mind would you consider I mean I, I will also speak to our officer as well our FC officer yeah. but would you consider that the the rest of the stand is now considered weakened and that we could fell it in your opinion I might just get a, a second opinion from Martin here yeah. I think that this this phrase growing trees applies yeah. doesn't it in this yeah. instance yeah, I, I think, I mean, this this is a bit of a developing issue at the moment, Alec, really, in terms of what you need felling licences for. But I think the current guidance is, is that if the tree is still attached to the root plate or the tree is still standing up, then you need a felling licence for it. Okay. It's only really in the instance where the tree has snapped that a felling licence wouldn't be required. Okay. Unless, of course, the tree is imminently dangerous. You know, if it's something which is over a bridal way as you say or over a property or something like that then then yes that you, you that would be an exception but but those standing trees or where they're still attached to a root plate and still sort of you know have the potential to be upright then then the felling license would be required for that um, okay you know i'll just just add the appraiser that we would always recommend that you contact your woodland officer in that sort of situation yeah. and if you do do anything you know if there are dangerous trees anything like that and you decide to fell them, always take photographs beforehand so that you can show what they were like. Uh, I, th I think I would just add to what Will would say, Ring. It does sound like that you, yeah. you've okay. got a difficult situation Brilliant. there. Um, it, it might, it's probably worth getting a forest manager in just to have a look at that boundary, see whether or not, you know, that it might be a wind firm. Although, you know, as you say, it's deep within the wood. If there was a if there was a clearing there, the fact that the, the, the wind blowers stopped at that point does indicate that there, there might be a degree of wind firmness. Mm. So it might just be worth thinking about. But 
you know, overall, it sounds like you've not got a good situation there, really, I'm afraid, Alec, and it might be, you know, better to just bite the bullet and get on with it. So, right. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so on that note. Um, so, um, uh, right, who's next? Alistair, um, you asked a question about um, natural regeneration. Um, I sort of answered in the chat, but if you would like to, if you're still around, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, Will might have something to add. I am, I am, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, and, oh, and, Alistair, um, hi. How are you doing? Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, not bad, thank you. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, I guess, so, uh, my question would be, um, and that, that the, the links in the chat were helpful, Martin, thank you for that. Um, so, so I get, so I'm, I'm a woodland advisor, as you know, Will, um, and I'm looking at kind of getting more into providing advice for woodland, woodland management, management rather than woodland creation, so I've done a lot of woodland creation stuff. And I was just wondering whether there's a sort of a, a standard approach to assessing a woodland's cap capacity for regeneration if you're looking at fell in an area. So is, is there a way to assess, you know, is there a, a threshold number of trees, a threshold mm. diversity of species that would give you a good indication that that would have the best potential for, for regenerating? Yeah. Um, and I actually have a, a, a cheeky slight second question, just kind yeah. of on the back of the question. You mentioned about trapping grey squirrels pre and after um, felling uh, or thinning operations in Bodleaf Woods. And I guess my question is, is there a kind of outline guide, guidance about how long before and how long after you might want to do that? Yeah. A uh, couple of really good questions. The first one, natural regen. Uh, seed trees, obviously key. Yeah. Uh, and what, what species do you want? Um, so if it's oak, are you going to get enough acorns? Uh, um, birch? much more easily kind of um, scatter its seed and, and, and regenerate. So check for your, your mature seed trees, um, uh, what you've got there. Um, uh, I'd sit and look at the soil. Um, uh, soil fertility can be important. Um, uh, and what your, what your potential competing vegetation might be with your, your, your natural regen. So, um, uh, if it's if it's more of a, a sort of an ancient woodland site, you're going to have less grasses that would be more competitive against your natural regen, um, and and you'll probably find that your 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 trees are going to regenerate more freely in those conditions as opposed to, you know, I don't know, let's say uh, a woodland that may have been, you know, not not on a uh, an ancient woodland site that could be. Um, uh, more prone to getting grasses and sedges and things like that coming in that would hamper uh, regen. Those are certainly some things I would look for. Um, uh, uh, deer control, again, signs of deer browsing, uh, already getting that in the wood. Uh, can you see sort of stripping and, and biting and rubbing and things like that? That will all um, uh, obviously uh, need, you need to think about that and how uh, if you're not controlling the deer, how you dissuade them from having a go at your regen. And then light levels, also key. How much light um, 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 uh, do you want to allow in uh, that's a balancing act between, you know, letting, let's say, those grasses and sedges overtake any regen, providing enough shade to keep those um, uh, under control. There's quite a lot of things to think about. Yeah, it, it, it's very frustrating, natural regeneration. I, I've seen it on sites that I didn't want it, and it's been just prolific. Um, and yeah. where I've wanted it on sites, we've not had it. You know, it's sort of mm -hmm. that age-old sods law uh, kicking in. Um, but those are some of the key things I would think about uh, when assessing yeah. a site for its suitability. Um, in terms of grey squirrels, I, I would start controlling them uh, at least one year before my thinning, and I do it uh, intensively the following two years because those are the peak flow and increases in your remaining trees those following two years. So the tree suddenly goes, oh, wow, I've got more space, I've got more light, I've got more water, I've got more nutrients, I'm going to start growing again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the flow and levels do uh, increase significantly, and those are the key periods. But, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly monitor my levels, of, of, yeah. of squirrels. Uh, if you're starting at a low point, then fantastic. Um, if if you know that they are present and lots of them, then yeah, you may need to really focus those efforts. 
Great. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Yeah, I, I just perhaps add that on the subject of natural regeneration, it's really worth thinking about um, variability within it because you will often tend to find that you get all of one thing. You know, you either get all all birch or all sycamore or whatever it might be, or all ash. Um, and it can be tempting to sort of think, oh, that's great, you know, I'll accept all that. But but um, that does mean that you are limited to one or two species, which mm. is a point of view of uh, resilience isn't a great thing. Um, so, you know, even if you, as I say, if you're swamped with birch, but maybe in amongst it, there's a few sycamore or oak or something, it might well be worth thinking about some thinning, you know, cleaning, as we used to call it, around those to, to try and promote those old, you know, just a few mm. species just to get a bit of variability. And, and the other thing, of course, is with ash, you might get a lot of natural regeneration from ash, but young ash is really, really prone to ash dieback. So, you know, yeah. it can get to sort of three or four years old and you'll just lose it all again. So don't don't assume that you've got something there, really. So, um, so, so worth sort of assessing uh, the regeneration um, and the, the composition, but then perhaps going in and doing some cutting and some, yeah. some supplementary planting. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the the intervention time will depend a little bit on the rate of growth and the rate of the rate of colonization, I suppose. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You're quite right. You know, the, it's something that needs managing. It's it's not one of those things that you can just look out after a year ago. Oh, that's yeah, great. You know, I've got loads of birch or whatever. I'd just let it go. So um, yeah, so that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair. Thanks. Um, uh, we've got a supplementary question from JP, which I'll ask on your behalf, JP. Just could you could you expand a little bit, Will, on on sort of how you can control squirrels? Just briefly, we've got two minutes. Oh, yeah. I'm sure people um, don't mind if you've got any. Okay, I mean, they are uh, very successful. Um, they're generalist and they are successful at surviving. Um, uh, uh, it's not it's not their fault. They're here, it's our fault. And they, like I say, they've, they've been very successful in, in colonising the UK. Um, so the most effective way of controlling grey squirrels is trapping. Um, but once you're trapped, you have to dispatch them. So it's illegal to release a grey squirrel back into the wild. So bear that in mind. A lot of people go for shooting, uh, but it isn't as effective as trapping. Trapping, you've got to be patient. You've got to set up your traps um, uh, and, and um, uh, disguise them, uh, get rid of your smell on them uh, by leaving them in a, in, a, in a strategic location for a few weeks, uh, cover them with, with, with leaf material, sticks, etc. Don't bait them. Just leave them there. Get get your smell off them. Get the woodland smell onto them, and then just start baiting around the trap. Don't put any bait inside the trap. Just bait around it again for a couple of weeks. Might might be longer. Might be three or four weeks. Just keep baiting. They particularly like crack maize and the kernels from crack maize, uh, but uh, pretty much anything goes with a grey squirrel. Uh, and then eventually open your trap and bait inside the trap. Uh, but it, you've got to be patient it will take a while for once once you start going and you're in a good location you can it can be a very successful method of doing it right thank, thank you well um right well we're dead on six o'clock so that's well done that's really good and i think we've also come to the end of the questions so um thank you very much will um and thank you to everybody for all those uh, questions and for listening in tonight i hope you found it useful um, I think judging by the you know the breadth and, and type of questions, it's it's obviously been a, a, a matter of some some real interest to you. Um, we we did record this session as we said at the beginning, and we'll be making that available online on YouTube uh, within the next few days. And when we send out the invite for the next webinar, we will include a link to that. So if you do want to watch it again and um, gen up on some of the subjects, then uh, then you know you'd be able to do that at that point. Um, so, uh, and let's say the next one is on the 11th of January. So, I think just now for me to say, wish you all a very happy Christmas and New Year. And thank you for joining us. And we will see you again in the new year. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye.